Galloway, and the mother of all talk shows. Welcome to the Open University of the Airwaves with George Galloway. Our friend Gonzalo Lira, the American broadcaster, is murdered in a Ukrainian dungeon. His president, Joe Biden, has his blood on his hands. The Hundred Day War in Gaza today saw biblical scenes of famine with thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people on the beach on Al Rashid Street running towards a reported food truck which had appeared, which was then gunned down by the Zionist occupation army, killing several, wounding many more. 30,000 people now dead in a hundred days. If this is not genocide, as Gideon Levy asked, well, exactly what is it? And the hundred year war against the people of the Yemen has resumed again. Just think about this point. British forces have been killing people in Yemen all of my life, all of my life. Think about it and fasten your seatbelts. This is going to be a bumpy night. It's the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. We would need to double the length of the show tonight to even begin to do justice to the huge number of extremely critical issues that have emerged since I last spoke to you. But this show is dedicated to the 55-year-old American correspondent, a regular guest on this show, a podcaster, a broadcaster, Gonzalo Lira Jr., who appeared so many times on this show and racked up many millions of views and will go on doing so. Because although the Ukrainian regime, the gangster, ultra-nationalist stroke, Nazi regime in Kiev, have succeeded in murdering Gonzalo, the things that he said during his period as a correspondent of ours and indeed under his own steam, under his round tables and all the many, many broadcasts that he gave are as pertinent today now that he is dead as they were when he was alive and speaking. Gonzalo Lira leaves a widowed wife and fatherless children and Joe Biden could have extricated him from that Ukrainian dungeon with a simple telephone call. But he refused to do so. The State Department refused to help him. The American embassy in Kiev refused to visit him, refused to check on what was happening to him. He was tortured, he was extorted, and finally he was murdered. He made a brief and valiant attempt to escape on a motorcycle, reaching all the way to the Hungarian border before being captured and taken back behind bars, where he has now died. Died doesn't do it. He was murdered. He was killed by a client regime of the United States, an American citizen, an American journalist, about which we hear blink and cackle so often that journalism is not a crime, that journalists are not criminals, that the United States enjoys a constitutionally enshrined right to report, right to speak and write freely, right to be able to read other people's speech and other people's writing. It is all a lie. It is all lipstick on a pig. The pig of so-called Western democracy, which now stands in the dock before the world, utterly bereft of any credibility, any shred of moral or intellectual uh, logic or consistency 
or feeling or empathy. They are monsters. We are ruled by monsters in Western countries. That's why uh, they are all ranged against the free republic of South Africa, which had to fight for decades, including in armed struggle, to overthrow the apartheid regime, which was the last iteration of colonial rule in South Africa. That's why they are all ranged against South Africa. That's why the British broadcast media did not broadcast live a single minute of South Africa's case at The Hague, in which they leveled a devastating indictment against the genocide taking place in Gaza, the horrors of East Jerusalem, the mass murder in the West Bank, the BBC and Sky News did not broadcast one live minute of South Africa's long day in court and then broadcast live all day Israel's rebuttal of a case that the British broadcasters had not even shown to their viewers in the case of the BBC to the taxpayers who on pain of imprisonment are coerced and forced bullied and browbeaten to fund lavishly to the tune of many billions of pounds per year. This is a betrayal, not just of the BBC's supposed charter. It is a betrayal of the British people, an ancient and free land which stood for a time alone for liberty and freedom whilst Nazism in its jackboots was at the Channel ports in France, about which more later. The British people have been betrayed not just by British broadcasters, but by the British political class. All of my life, and I mean all of my life, the British armed forces have been killing Arab Muslims. All of it. I was born in 1954. In 1956, in an illegal conspiracy, Britain and France and Israel invaded Egypt and tried to capture from the Egyptian government of the hero Gamal Abdel Nasser, the Suez Canal itself. A Suez Canal now effectively closed to British and American ships as well, of course, as ships to or from Israel. I watched as a 14-year-old the Yemeni people rise up against British colonial rule, exercised by Scotsmen in kilts playing bagpipes in the port of Aden. I watched as a 14-year-old whilst Mad Mitchell, Colonel Colin Mitchell, fresh, if that's the word, from murdering Koreans in large numbers with the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders in the illegal war to try to maintain the partition of the Korean Peninsula. Mitchell in charge, ordering the gunning down of brave Yemeni people who had risen up to kick out their colonial occupiers. People of Yemen were occupied by Britain for 130 years. And Britain is now back at war with Yemen. A completely illegal war, which didn't even receive the rubber stamp, for that is all that it would have been, of British parliamentary approval, which doesn't have a shred of legality from the United Nations Security Council. Not only did they not get a decision of the, Euro the United Nations Security Council in favor of this violent attack on one of the poorest countries in the world, they didn't even ask for one. They didn't even put it to the United Nations Security Council which alone has the power 
to endorse military action of this kind. Unless it's self-defense, of course. Except Britain is thousands of miles away from the Red Sea and the coast of Yemen. Except no British shipping had been harmed in any way. No British citizen had been killed. No citizen of anywhere had been killed. Not one death in the Yemen blockade of Israel to try and force a ceasefire in a conflict which has already cost more than a hundred thousand casualties, at least 30,000 dead, at least 60,000 wounded and unable to be treated in barely functioning hospitals without electricity, without medicine, and increasingly without doctors because Israel is making a particular habit of killing doctors and killing journalists. And if you think that that is a coincidence, I have a bridge here in London that I can sell you going cheap. The great British half-Palestinian surgeon Abu Sita speaking in London at yet another mammoth demonstration of the British people's rejection of all of this at the weekend says that Israel is torturing doctors. Speaking of which, I have just seen a most distressing video of the former Moats medic and my former colleague, former colleague, Dr. Ranjit Bra, an NHS surgeon with his shoulder out of joint, with handcuffs, handcuffing him behind his back, leaving his four-year-old child on the pavement of central London yesterday and now held overnight, apparently under the Prevention of Terrorism Act. His crime I don't know, standing next to a leaflet which had words on it which the Metropolitan Police did not like? Is this what our fathers fought for? Did my grandfathers give their blood at Dunkirk, at El Alamein, at Monte Cassino? They gave their blood for freedom so that NHS surgeons can be handcuffed, their shoulders dislocated, their babies abandoned on the street because of words on a leaflet. This country is going to the dogs. It is riven with social and cultural and racial disharmony. Our people are cold. 14 million of them are in poverty. Some are hungry. So it was a good time for Mr. Sunak from accounts to go to Kiev and hand over another 2.5 billion pounds of our taxes. I was in the London borough of Newham at length on Friday. I tell you what, we really could have done with that two and a half billion pounds to attack the public squalor everywhere visible in the East End of London, as in so many towns and cities around this country. But we've got money to give to the crooks in Kiev. We've got money to burn setting fire to people in Yemen. This country is going to the dogs, not just because it has an unelected, rancid little inky-fingered Indian clerk as our Prime Minister, but because we have a King's Council, white as the driven snow, leader of the Labour opposition, who's a traitor to everything that the Labour Party is supposed to stand for, and a traitor to everything that could justifiably be called 
the British values for which we stood and fought during the Second World War. Keir Starmer, who once said Britain should never go to war again without parliamentary approval, gave his 100% support to the new, renewed British war on Yemen, to punish the people of Yemen for being the only Arab Muslim country to actually do something to try and stop the slaughter in Gaza. And his little amenuensis, his little Robin, Wes Streeting, goes on television this morning justifying the attack on Yemen and calls it an open and shut case, vital for Britain's national defense. You could not make all of this up. And you have no need to. It's happening in real time, even though it is rejected by tens of millions in Britain, scores of millions in the United States, tens of millions in France, in Germany, in the Netherlands, all over these countries that are taking us into war after war after war. It is extraordinary that we went to war to protect shipping containers, only shipping containers connected to Israel, but we will not even demand a ceasefire in the Israeli genocide that has killed and maimed and lost more than 100,000 people in just 100 days. On the contrary, it's not just that we won't demand a ceasefire. We are fully participating in the slaughter of the innocents. Today on Al Rashid Street, on the beachfront in Gaza, a street I have walked and driven a hundred times. Tens of thousands of people were pictured, filmed, running along the street, running along the beach, tens of thousands of them, because a rumor had arisen that a food truck to feed the multitudes of starving people. Four out of every five starving people in the world today are in the Gaza Strip. A piece of land 25 miles long and five and a half miles wide. Four out of every five starving people in the world are there. When the occupation army saw the crowds running for the food truck in desperation for something to eat for their families, they opened fire and mowed them down. All day and every day, little children are being murdered and maimed. Their mothers are being murdered and maimed. And the Western media and its political class, if I can dignify it with that name, slaves to Joe Biden's administration in Washington, slaves to the hated Benjamin Netanyahu regime, are fully complicit in the murder. My last words are about South Africa itself. I have blood in the game, my own blood on the floor of Guguletu police station in Cape Town. Irish blood on my maternal line. And when I saw this dazzlingly able team of journalists, of lawyers, black African lawyers, 
Asian South African Muslim lawyers, Irish lawyers, lay out the case that Israel is guilty of genocide, it would have brought a tear to a glass eye in perfect legal language, in impeccable intellectual logic. The great South African legal team, led by their minister of law, made a case that simply cannot be answered and was not answered. The South African case that Israel is guilty of genocide is, as Gideon Levy, the greatest of all Israelis, the Israeli journalist from Haaretz newspaper said, if this is not genocide, there is no such thing as genocide. And there never has been any such thing as genocide. If it is not genocide, for everyone from the president and the prime minister and the defense minister and the chief of the army and ministers galore and members of the Knesset galore and military officers on the ground, if they are all singing from an Old Testament hymn book that they intend to clear finish the 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, if that is not genocidal intent, followed by acts to carry out that genocidal intent, visible to half the world already, on their telephone, on their computer, if not on their television screen. If that is not genocide, there is no such thing as genocide. Now, the best of the British, myself and my wife included, my children included, were on the streets of Britain on these demonstrations in virtually every town and city, the length and breadth of the land at the weekend. And I will again be on the Birmingham demonstration next Saturday. And I invite you all to join me but one of the best of the British, the Honourable Craig Murray, former British ambassador, was sleeping on the pavement in The Hague so that he could attend this genocide trial and bring us by far and away the finest coverage of what was happening there. And you're lucky he's up first as our first guest tonight on the mother of all talk shows. Stay tuned. There's a group of people in Twitter who are daily posting discussions about Gaza, Lebanon, what's happening, news updates, aid for Gaza. Uh, and trying to enlist the help of Jordan and France and any other regional entity that will help get more aid into Gaza and all of Gaza, all of Palestine, for everyone who suffers. So I want to request that everyone who is listening to this go to your local council meetings and peacefully request that their representatives at the local levels do this because it works. Thanks for the call, Pia, in Uruguay. I'm a free man of the city of San Francisco, awarded to me for my work on Palestine, on the steps of City Hall itself. So it was a particular delight for me that the San Francisco Council voted by eight votes to three to demand a ceasefire. And that decision didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of campaigning to force the local authority representatives to vote. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway.
I've just received news that the very last mosque in northern Gaza has been destroyed by Israel. Just think about that. We've got a poll running. It looks like a record poll, actually. 33,230 people have already voted. Are the US-UK attacks on Yemen justifiable self-defense? Yes or no. Get voting. On my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway. On my Twitter account, look out for the blue tick. On the YouTube community poll and on the YouTube stream. If you're watching on the YouTube stream or on Facebook or anywhere that allows you to do so, please share the fact that this show is now running and that your friends and contacts should join it. Craig Murray is a man of great intellect, a great uh, integrity, and perhaps, greatest of all, a man of great courage. And despite being done certain ash, he was actually sleeping on the pavement in a sleeping bag outside of the Palace of Justice in The Hague so that he could report to his many followers on Twitter and on his other platforms and now report to you about what he saw there. Please welcome the Honourable Craig Murray. Craig, thanks for uh, joining us. Um, I hope your bones have thawed. Uh, I'm past the age now where I can safely sleep on a sidewalk, on a pavement, in a sleeping bag in The Hague in January, but you did it. So before you get into the nitty gritty of the case itself, kindly paint for us a picture of what the whole scene was like, of what the whole experience was like in The Hague. Well, it was extremely difficult to get in. I mean, they, the public gallery admits 14 people for a case of, of world importance. 14 people were, were allowed in. Um, on the first day, there were eventually perhaps 400 people in the queue for those 14 places. Um, I had to get there literally at, at 2 o'clock in the morning and start um, queuing up. Um, and that day, that first day, I didn't have a sleeping bag. And it was um, minus five. It was very cold. Um, and I stood there till half past six in the morning when they finally gave out the passes for people to be admitted. But the, it was a good atmosphere. Um, all 400 people who were trying to get in, every single one of them was a, was a fervent supporter of the Palestinians, I think I would say. Um, there was an excitement about it. People believed this was a chance for justice, a, a chance to actually do something, a, a, and a chance to hold the perpetrators of genocide to account. Um, it's also worth saying that uh, Jeremy Corbyn and Jean-Luc Mélenchon both turned up uh, to be in the public gallery. Uh, both of them slightly cheated in that they had somebody stand in for them for a while, but they both still nonetheless turned up themselves at 5.30 in the morning and stood for two hours in, in sub-zero temperatures queuing uh, to get in. Uh, and of course, once the event started, there were many thousands of people gathered outside uh, to support. People who'd come from all over Europe, people who'd come from uh, I met people who'd come from Australia. Uh, I met people who'd come from Pakistan. I met people who'd come from Peru and people who'd come from West Indies. Uh, so um, it, it really was quite a quite a gathering of of, of like-minded people. And there was a, a definite feeling that this was a major turning point in history. Now, either international human rights law and the idea of international courts and international justice was going to prevail, or we're going to see that all that is a thing of the past, but essentially the United States and the United Kingdom and, and their allies have destroyed the idea of international law uh, and that the only law is force and, and the ability to, to kill your your opponents. And, and that was the real 
feeling of the event, I think. This is an absolute turning point in history where the international community and international humanitarian organizations actually stand up to the United States or they are effectively finished. It was a red letter day inside, wasn't it? Uh, I have seldom seen, witnessed, uh, um, an unrelenting, brilliant, unanswerable case pressed for hours by such talented counsel uh, as I saw on Thursday in the South African case. Did it feel that way to you? Yeah, it, it, it did. It was electric at times inside the, inside the room. Um, and I thought what was particularly brilliant was that the South African team took a definite decision not to rely on emotion and, and theatre. You know, they could have produced literally thousands of photos of dead children, you know, of maimed children, of mutilated children. Um, they could have appealed to the to the emotions in a very direct way because of the appalling things that are being done to the people of Gaza. But they deliberately did not do that. They didn't show one single atrocity photo. What they did was very calmly and rationally set out the absolute horror of what is happening in words. And, and the words piled up one after another, but there was no theatrical or emotional delivery. It was reason, pure, hard reason, setting out the arguments, setting out the facts. And the facts were so horrible in themselves, you didn't need any more. And certainly um, in the uh, South African delegation, which I, I could see below me, and in the public gallery, there were tears in people's eyes. Um, the problem is, of course, the judges. I mean, the judges just did not look comfortable. But to, to my mind, they, they looked like they did not want to be there. You know, they, they've been put in an invidious position where an unanswerable case, really, has been set out against Israel, which means against the United States and the United Kingdom as well, because they are obviously uh, implicated in providing the weapons and support and intelligence and surveillance and everything else. Um, and... You know what are the judges to do? They look like they would love to find any way of getting, of getting out of this, because, you know, they are establishment people. Of course, uh, they uh, face the difficulties that that come into your life if you stand up against the United States and and and, and Israel. And they they very much look like they would love to find a way out of it. The only times they really got animated is where procedural questions were being discussed, where questions of jurisdiction were being discussed, and the question of whether or not there was possibly an argument that South Africa didn't have standing to bring the case or the court didn't have jurisdiction. Those kind of things were the only things that really made them animated. Uh, and it, uh, it, it was fairly obvious, you know, if they could find a way to duck this, then they would. Craig, I, I talked to uh, another British ambassador, retired British ambassador, uh, yesterday in London, uh, who incidentally recalled the days when he used to read your dispatches from Uzbekistan and, and opined that these were dazzling, brilliant dispatches, although, as he said, focused on human rights. Uh, which, of course, is what got you sacked. You were over-focused on human rights, according to the Labour Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, uh, at the time. But as a man so long in love with uh, the idea of international law, of human rights, and so on. And I confess, I never really was. I always felt it was lipstick on a pig. I always felt there was no such thing as international law. Where do you stand now as much a dedicated defender of the international legal structures and systems or, and so on? Or do you feel, especially if this case goes the wrong way, 
that it's over, that all that stuff was for the birds. Well, you're, you're right in that my entire working life and career, both when I was in the Foreign Office and, and outside, has been dedicated really to trying to make the rule of law, the rule of international law stick uh, and international humanitarian law stick. Um, the greatest blow was dealt, of course, uh, over the war in Iraq, where the UK and US invaded Iraq with their allies, uh, not only without having Security Council agreement, but in the direct knowledge that the Security Council disagreed. You know, after um, months and months of trying to get Security Council agreement, they could not get. And um, you know, I said at the time that what what we are doing to the United Nations is what Hitler did to the League of Nations or Mussolini did to the League of Nations when he invaded Abyssinia, for example. Um, so I think I think that was a huge blow. Uh, whether the structure of um, international humanitarian law could ever recover was an open question. There was another huge blow when the International Criminal Court decided that it could not uh, prosecute Bush or Blair over the Iraq war, and then decided it could not uh, prosecute British soldiers over offences committed in the Iraq war, even ones which had been committed after the uh, Statute of Rome came into effect, because their excuse about Bush and Blair was that their actions were before the Statute of Rome came into effect. So that was another blow. Um, and I think uh, it, it's difficult. It, it's difficult to hang on to belief in the system. There have been many ICJ judgments over the years which have been respected. And it does look, for example, as though eventually uh, Britain is moving towards respecting the ICJ on handing over control of the Chagos Islands to Mauritius, for example. So, uh, you know, there are occasional beams of hope. Um, but no, I mean, in this case, <laughs> the case for genocide is so overwhelming so unanswerable in logic that and this is such a major thing you know this is a genocide being carried out before the eyes of the whole world in an age where despite their killing of journalists everybody's been able to see it and no i shall um i shall give up i i, I mean if this court ruling goes the wrong way um i will have to decide that the only hope for oppressed people is in, in armed resistance, and, and there is no uh, effective chance ever of, of remedy through the uh, international system. Um, and I should be very, very sad to reach that conclusion, but, but I, I, I do think that is where, where this is potentially leading. Now, the right to protect that uh, bogus substitute for uh, international law the United Nations and the rest, devised by uh, the aforementioned Tony Blair and Bill Clinton in the Chicago Doctrine, uh, turns out to uh, exist for shipping containers too. We have the right to protect shipping containers on Israeli vessels or on other vessels going to or from Israel in the Red Sea. We have the right to make war on a sovereign country, Yemen, and now we've had three days of relentless bombardment, almost a hundred targets across the country. And today, uh, a port, yesterday, the airport, the Sana International Airport yesterday. Uh, we're now at war with Yemen. I say we, effectively, I mean the US and the UK again, because although there are uh, one or two satraps uh, acting as Batman for the uh, uh, for for the occasion. Uh, the killing is being done by UK and US troops entirely without legal justification on an international level, and even the rubber stamp of a parliamentary vote. We've been killing Yemenis all my life, Craig, and all of your life. I mean, it's entirely illegal in international law. Plainly, there's no justification for it. Um, the, you know, the Yemenis block shipping lanes to try to stop the killing in Gaza. 
Um, and we respond to that by killing Yemenis, as opposed to by stopping the killing in Gaza, which would be the more logical way to uh, reopen the shipping lanes. Uh, and as you quite rightly say, this has a long, long history. Uh, Yemen was conquered by the British during the first Afghan war, in fact, uh, back in the 1840s. Um, and has a long and noble history of resistance. Of course, in the latest phase, for the last decade, we've been killing Yemenis through really using the proxies, the Saudis as proxies, but armed with British largely aircraft and weapons and, 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 and bombs and supported by British special forces and with, with, with maintenance of all those weapon systems by British personnel based in Saudi Arabia. Um, this is just, if you like, the latest and most blatant phase. It, it, it It's very horrible. I, I want to just move on, though, to um, day two of the ICJ hearing, which was just astonishing. I've, I've only just published, literally in the last hour, published my account of day two, uh, partly because it was so difficult to write, because the things the Israelis were saying, um, you couldn't believe they were saying them. You just could not believe this actually was seriously being said in a, in a court of law. Um, they said, for example, that the reason there were so many damaged civilian buildings and infrastructure and houses in Gaza was that they'd all been damaged by Hamas booby traps and the misfire of 2,000 Hamas rockets. And it hadn't been the Israelis who had damaged the infrastructure at all. They said that there are now 50% more food trucks entering Hamas every day than were entering before October the 7th. Uh, they said they had found incontrovertible evidence that every single hospital in Gaza was used by Hamas as a military base. I, I mean, we were just, and that's just some of the stuff they were saying. I mean, it was quite incredible. You know, it's as all they, though they sat down and thought, well, how do we tackle this? And then they said, well, let's just respond with, totally outrageous and unbelievable lies to the everything and thus make a, a mockery of the entire proceeding. It, it was really, it, you know, it felt sickening. I, I felt dirty after sitting through three hours of, 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 of this. It really was astonishing to be there and, and hear such guff, which they knew was rubbish. I mean, they don't believe it. I mean, they knew the judges don't believe it. The, the purpose of it was, of course, international propaganda. Um, uh, because you know, the court's not actually going to, to accept any of those things as fact. Um, but it, their total lack of respect, if you, if you like, their arrogance, their sense of impunity, that they can just tell any kind of outrageous lie they want. Well, even mass murderers are entitled to a defence. I suppose the lawyers were only uh, saying, doing what they were briefed to say and uh, do. Uh, Craig, when will we hear uh, any interim verdict in the case? Well, I George, I'm just looking at another dimension in this uh, Gaza war conflict. Could this be a religious conflict in the guise of it's not Islam versus Christianity versus Judaism, but an ideology, a, a Zionist ideology in establishing their leader that is supposed to come in the future and they will then govern and rule? It's in their ideology, for sure. 
the Zionists are uh, no more and no less than a nationalist ideology. They are nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Anybody who thinks Netanyahu is religious hasn't looked too closely into his private life. These people are extreme nationalists, exceptionalists. Some Americans believe in American exceptionalism. Zionists believe in Jewish exceptionalism. Nobody in truth is exceptional. There's nothing religious about it. It's about land. It's about nationalist supremacy, ethno-religious supremacy on the land of Palestine. And the Europeans colonized Palestine in the same way that the Europeans colonized South Africa. So fitting, the victims of white European colonialism are coming to the aid of other victims of white European colonialism. And they're doing the whole world a signal service. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Do vote in the poll. I'd really like it to be a record poll, and it's heading that way. Are the US-UK attacks on Yemen justifiable self-defense? Yes or no. You can vote on all platforms. If you want to comment on what you've heard so far, if you're in the US or Canada, it's toll-free, and the number is plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. If you're in the UK or Ireland, again, free of charge, it's 0808196552. And if you're in the rest of the world, as indeed I am myself after my brief sojourn in London, it's 0044203966225. Lots of emails flooding in uh, for uh, Craig Murray, just one Jean Francisco Rusti. Juan Francisco Urusti, thank you, Craig Murray, for representing humankind. And there's hundreds of messages like that. Professor Syed Mohammed Marandi is the chair of American studies at the University of Tehran. There's much to study about America at the University of Tehran. It seems for 40, 50, 60 years, maybe more. The United States has been an overbearing, usually threatening presence in, around, over, under Iran. And it's no different today. Professor Morandi, one of our most popular and learned guests, joins us again now. Uh, Professor, thank you uh, for uh, coming on the Mother of All Talk shows again. You're most cooperative, I must say. Uh, it, they're, they're getting closer and closer to you. Uh, do you think Iran is the big enchilada, that all of this is uh, an encroachment, an encirclement, uh, or are there, as it were, non-Iranian uh, linked issues at play in the US-UK attack on Yemen? Obviously, Iran is not going to change its policy. Iran will continue to support the resistance in Yemen, in Gaza, in Lebanon, and Iraq and Syria. And no amount of escalation is going to change that. Iran has been under maximum pressure sanctions for many years now. And the reason for those maximum pressure sanctions is Iran's policy towards uh, Palestine. It's If Iran were to compromise with the West on Palestine, all of these sanctions would be gone. But there's a principle that the Iranians have always stated, and they've always believed in, and they will continue to pursue, and that is that apartheid in the whole of Palestine must come to an end. And uh, the Israelis, they have to set aside this regime where Palestinians are sub considered to be subhuman and where other Palestinians are expelled from their land 
and where we see Palestinians killed regularly. So these sanctions, the pressure against Iran is linked to this. Iran will continue to stay the course, but I don't think really the United States is in a position to escalate too far. And the reason is that Yemen is not the Yemen of five, six, seven, eight years ago. Just like in Gaza, we see a new a new type of, a new capability in the resistance where they've been able to humiliate the Israeli regime. In previous battles, that's not how things went. There's, the Israelis would batter Gaza, they would massacre people, and then the Gazans would maybe hit a tank or two, uh, fire a few rockets, which would usually be stopped by the Iron Dome. But now we see that Gaza, despite the uh, atrocities, despite the uh, genocide, despite what the, the Holocaust, they have been able to uh, defeat the Israelis on the battlefield. Now, Gaza, this extraordinary defense capability, these underground tunnels that have been created, they are something which the Israeli regime doesn't know how to deal with. So imagine what it is like for the Americans against Yemen. I've spoken to a couple of people who know a good deal about what's going on in Yemen, and they said that the American airstrikes had no impact on the defense capabilities of the Yemeni armed forces or Ansar Allah, or what the Americans like to call the Houthis, or Westerners call the Houthis. Ansar Allah, or the Yemeni army defenses, are, mo are underground, and they are not accessible to uh, the United States. They will come out, do what they need to do, and then go back to their many underground tunnels. And it is a huge country, a mountainous country, and there's no comparison. There's no comparison between Yemen and Gaza. And then, of course, there's Lebanon. The Israelis keep saying that they're going to take out Hezbollah, but they don't because they know they cannot win a war there. So I find it highly unlikely that the Americans would expand the war all the way to the Persian Gulf. That won't happen, most probably. Of course, madmen can do anything, but I'm just I'm assuming they're not that mad because the resistance would take a, a a new form in Iraq. It would take a new form in Syria. And of course, all those countries that have that host American bases in the Persian Gulf region would be hostile. And all of their assets are right alongside the Persian Gulf coast. So I, I find it very hard to believe that the Americans would push it that far, especially as the war in Ukraine is still ongoing and the tensions with China, especially after the elections in Taiwan are probably not going to get any better. Uh, I I think that, although I do believe that escalation, we are moving towards escalation, but I think the sort of escalation that you may have been alluding to in your question is, is further off. The uh, attacks though were substantial. Uh, a lot of assets, the German Navy is arriving uh, in the Red Sea. What could possibly go wrong? A German warship on the move uh, into the Red Sea. Um, the UK and US are all guns blazing, even though th there's not a shred of legal uh, cover for it, not even a rubber stamped British Parliament vote never mind international law. Uh, do you think it's just for show then? Uh, or how serious is the uh, Biden-Sunak war on Yemen? Well, it could get very serious. First of all, I think we have to sort of go back a bit. When the Yemeni Navy warned ships not to go to Israeli ports, they would not target those ships unless they disobeyed. And they didn't sink any of those ship, ships. They they damaged them. 
to force them to leave. No one was killed. And then the Americans went and massacred uh, 10 young Yemeni sailors because they don't care. They don't care about human life, just wiping out families. They're, they're like the Israelis. These people don't matter. So, the but the Yemeni armed forces imposed a blockade on Israel because of the genocide, because of Gaza. It didn't begin before the war in Gaza. It began after the genocide was taking all those lives. If the Americans and the British are so upset or so concerned about international shipping, well, just a, three four years ago, ships that were taking fuel to Syria were constantly being attacked by the Israeli regime in the Mediterranean. So why weren't the Americans or the British worried about international shipping and security and global trade when Syrian ships were being attacked or Iranian ships taking fuel to Syria. So the issue is not international trade because the Yemeni armed forces told everyone repeatedly that only ships that refuse to obey orders that are going to Israeli ports will be targeted. But now what the Americans have done because of the attack is that they force the Yemeni armed forces to say that, okay, now American and British ships and those who are involved in the aggression and the violence in the Red Sea, those ships can no, are no longer safe. So the Americans are pushing towards an escalation that will only get worse. And then if the Americans are humiliated and another ship is targeted, then they're going to have to escalate, at least in their warped uh worldview, they, they'll feel that they have to escalate, and then things will get out of control. This is something that I think you discussed from the beginning of the Gaza war, is that once war begins, when it as it expands, as it, as it continues, it tends to expand. And then things happen which um, lead to reactions that cause escalation. And when, and when things escalate, it becomes increasingly difficult to control the situation. So the Americans are pushing their luck. They are pushing the conflict towards a place where there may be major conflict in the Red Sea. And if that happens, I have no doubt that the Americans will fail. They cannot stop Yemen. Yemen has prepared itself for this. Why has Yemen prepared itself for this? Because for seven years, the Saudis were bombing them day and night with American and British support. They've learned to build underground assets. They've learned to put everything in a safe place so that they cannot be bombed because they've already experienced seven years of, of airstrikes, airstrikes that were carried out with US support. The Saudis spent over $200 billion fighting the war against Yemen, over $200 billion. And then, of course, we had the American hunger siege. They imposed a, a siege on uh, Yemen, uh, the Saudis, the Emiratis, and the Americans, preventing food from getting in. They imposed a starvation siege to bring the people of Yemen to their knees, and they failed. So how are a few Tomahawk missiles going to change the uh, situation on the battlefield? How is it going to change the balance of power? The Yemenis have already prepared themselves for such a day. I was involved in the uh, Mavi Marmara and my staff were on board the Mavi Marmara, the Turkish ship that was sailing with aid to the starving people in Gaza. Israel boarded the ship killed nine people, one of them a joint Turkish-American citizen. Nobody did anything about that act of piracy. And yet the UK and, and the US and where did they target the have ship? gone to war in international waters. Exactly. In international it is waters. Indeed. Professor, as always, a great pleasure indeed and honor.
to interview you. Thanks for joining us on the Mother of Thank you, George. Talk Shows. I'm going to take a break now. Coming up, all your calls and comments on the late Gonzalo Lira. Stay tuned. You don't get to call me far right. You don't get to call me that on my own show. A lifelong socialist, the leader of a socialist party, the Workers' Party of Britain, with an Indonesian wife, with five mixed-race children, with a record of fighting racism all of my life, representing more people of color in the British Parliament than anyone in history by a country mile. You don't get to call me far right. These kind of idiotic insults tossed around by infantile leftists who think that anyone to the right of them is a fascist, is a racist. They are the cause of the crashing and burning of what used to be called the left. They are the cause of it. They have discredited leftism with their foolish, idiot isms and ists and smears that emanate from them like a bad smell. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. A huge wave of sympathy and admiration, respect for the late Gonzalo Lira. Owen Otis says, Gonzalo Lira was truly a definition of pure kindness, rough, true, and raw, but kind. This is bizarre. I can't get over it. I've been following him for over seven years, ever since his first CRP videos. He really liked you, George, and thought of you as his real friend, especially after his first arrest. May his poor soul rest in peace. Bye, coach. That's from Owen Otis. Uh, Grassi Knoll says Gonzalo only needed some inexpensive antibiotics. And Dalibor Findura says they denied him medical treatment. Sorry, I got to know Moats because of him. R.I.P. Gonzalo. And Loza says they denied him medical treatment for pneumonia. Evil. And Mario Moraes says Gonzalo Lira should have left Ukraine before being detained and continued his work. He risked too much and paid the price. Well, another way of putting that is he wasn't going to be run out of town by gangsters and thugs. He had a wife, he had children there in uh, Kharkov, in Ukraine, and he was not going to run away. I suppose he thought being an American citizen, the American government would, as it's constitutionally obliged to do, help to, to protect him. But sadly, they did not. Now, on Thursday, it's a real scoop, actually. No to NATO, no to war, uh, founded by uh, the Workers' Party of Britain that I uh, lead, but which has now brought together more and more wide, wide platforms and audience of millions, has a special on the Yemen war. Brilliant graphic, that. Uh, but it includes, as our star speaker, a member of the Politburo of Ansar Allah and governor of one of the areas that has been bombed by UK and US uh, warplanes. So that's on Thursday, the 18th of January at 8 p.m. UK time, 9 p.m. Central European time, 11 p.m. Yemen time. Uh, and a very, very good platform, great graphic, great meeting. That's on Thursday. Of course, I'll tell you about it again on Wednesday when, God willing, we have the midweek mother of all talk shows. The one and only Erobus is on the line from New York on Gonzalo Lira. Erobos, welcome. Greetings and salutations, Mr. Galloway, and a salubrious health to you, you 
your loved ones follow us and the mother of all talk shows. Um, first of all, you know, I, I, it's necessary for me to say, you know, as a, per, as a part of my core morality, you know, maybe soul and spirit of Gonzalo Lira be preserved, even though, like yourself, you know, I, I'm a member of the anti-establishment left, you know, not a liberal, not a progressive. Those words have been hollowed out and destroyed mm-hmm. by the liberals, mm-hmm. you know, and that there were views, you know, like his views on immigration and things like this. I have, you know, visceral disagreements with him on. However, the fact remains, from my perspective, he, he gave his life for his journalism and his beliefs. Right? He had plenty of opportunities to flee, which is what most of us would have done. I know I would not have stood in a Nazi regime country and reported from there, knowing that I'd end up you know, dead or tortured, which is what happened to him. So in effect, he had, even though he had a different ideology to Julian Assange, he had the same core morality. And morality, it's either intellectual or we feel it at our core. This is why people change position from Ukraine to uh, to Israel. You know, a lot of the same people, these so-called uh, right-wingers, you know, they were all on board to, to be uh, about ending the war in Ukraine and, you know, the Zelensky regime and all of this. And when it came to re- Israel, they're banning, deplatforming, slapping people down and all the rest of it because their morality is not felt at their core. It's a thought exercise. It's a, it's a philosophical, academic morality. And it takes instances like these in the world to show, to reveal people. You know, I, I've, been, um, I've been having this clear view about this ever since Jimmy Dore, you know, pushed the uh, force to vote, and it's been ongoing ever since. However, back to, uh, back to Mr. Lira, um, you know, and, and you know his father. From what I from what I've seen, he, he came on the Mother of All talk shows first, and you know which which populated the the, the media universe. And he was able to go Tucker Carlson, and he was on the Duran. You know, I can imagine his loss. You know, well, I, actually, I can't imagine his loss because I don't have children of my own. But I can empathize. And you know, and the last thing I would say, because I know there's always you know time is always against us. It, it comes back to this central point and why the work you're doing and the work of the Workers' Party and Chris Williamson and all the people on board on that is so vital and so important. Good people, they, for whatever reason, they, they don't want power, right? They think power would corrupt them. But the fact of the matter is, and your life has demonstrated this, if you're a person that's weak and you have an intellectual sense of morality, you're going to be compromised. People who avoid power, you leave a vacuum for the corrupt, the sociopaths, the psychopaths, the dark empaths. They populate leadership because the good do nothing. And when the good do nothing, evil always triumphs. This is what it comes down to. And even even the Honorable Craig Murray, who you just had on prior to the magnificent Professor Saeed, you know, even he stated this like, I've come to the point in my life for a man of such his caliber, his caliber and integrity to come to such a point in his life to say, you know what, even Martin Luther King, which is what we're celebrating here on Monday, I won't call it much of a celebration, more of a remembrance, even Dr. King to the, to the end of his life said, said to, the, uh, to the great Harry Belafonte, I think that I've integrated my people into a burning house. Right, we we they have reached such a resist such a level now that armed resistance and armed conflict it, it seems to be the only outcome for some people. But you you're showing you're demonstrating with with what's with what's left that we have to take power. It, it's not a matter of choice or question. We we have to do it. It's not for ourselves to preserve the world, to preserve you know people we care about, our family, our friends. You know, without power, change is not possible. And I don't want to go on a continuous rant, but I don't think people really get it. They, they think that, you know, everyone is like them, right? Everyone believes what they believe, and if they just have the right to be let alone and live a basic life. No, there are people that want to dominate this. 
There are people that want to, to control us. And if we don't challenge these people directly and push them out the way, we'll be crushed. We're going into an ap apocalyptic future like Mad Max, and we can stop that. While, and your, your example of the People's Party is the most prescient and poignant example I can muster in the Western world. And thank you to the Workers' Party. Thanks to you, uh, Mr. Galloway, and uh, more power to all of us. God bless you, Arobos, in New York for that extraordinary uh, contribution. Uh, the comments on Gonzalo are flooding in. Shamrock once said, GG, words fail me. Your monologue was extraordinary, and as always, you hit the nail on the head. I'm also very sorry for the death and captivity of Gonzalo Lira. May God have mercy on his soul. AS2023 says, Victoria Newland despised Gonzalo. And Ramplense01 said, Mr. Lira Sr. emailed the State Department every other day, begging them to release his son, but never even got an answer from them. And EM says, he dared to say that Zelensky's regime was a disgrace, and he was murdered for it. On line one in England, in Essex, is Margaret about the ICJ. Go ahead, Margaret. Oh, hello, Galloway. Um, first of all, thank you very much for everything you say. Um, as a Palestinian Christian, I would like to know your thoughts about, first of all, what would happen to the very few of us left um, if the Islamic extremism take over. Uh, my second question is about uh, the head judge at the ICJ court. We all know that she's got a tarnished history about uh, the case of Mauritius um, when she ruled against um, the Mauritian people when uh, England wanted to ethnic cleanse the villagers from there to create an American war base. So how far can we trust that the case for the Palestinian will be uh, fair? Well, about as far as uh, I could throw the former governor of New Jersey who's running while well, waddling actually for uh, the uh, uh, Republican nomination uh, nowadays. Chris Christie uh, is three times the man he was when he came into politics. So as far as I could throw him, uh, I wouldn't uh, automatically trust any of those judges. I don't automatically trust anybody. Uh, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. All I know is that an absolutely unanswerable case was made. No attempt was made to rebut it because how could it possibly be rebutted? South Africa's case was stitching together all of the statements made by the highest personages of the Israeli state and the dancing TikTok demonstration by their soldiers on the ground of them actually committing the genocidal acts which their politicians had exhorted them uh, to do. So there's no answer to that. As I think Craig Murray said, not in the interview, but in his report, it's the court itself that's on trial. It's any lingering expectation or hope that there is an international legal system at all that is on trial. If this court were to find in favor of Netanyahu, it would be for many like Craig Murray who spent his whole life in this orbit of ICJs, ICCs, human rights, all the infrastructure, superstructure of human rights, uh, it will leave them bereft with nothing further that they can hope for or speak about. It will mean that we have 
As I've always believed in truth that we do have, we have the law of the jungle. And that might is right. And that political power comes out the battle of a gun. I've always believed that that was how the world was run. I've always believed that all these international organizations, fora, and so on, were just lipstick on the pig. Now, turning to the rather odd question uh, that you asked about Islamic extremists. Well, the real Islamic extremists are on the side of America and Israel. Al-Qaeda, ISIS are the arch enemies of the partisans in Gaza. The arch enemies of the partisans in Lebanon, South Lebanon. They're the arch enemies of the partisans in Iraq. They're the Islamic extremists and they are the allies of the very imperial powers that are shooting starving people on Al Rashid Street in Gaza right now. The war graves of British soldiers in Gaza that I have visited from the First World War contained the graves of several British soldiers who were Jews, whose Star of David is emblazoned on their gravestone. Who has been looking after those gravestones from 1918 until now, for more than a hundred years? The people of Gaza. There's nothing about the political power in the West Bank, in Jerusalem or in Gaza that is hostile to Jesus and to Christ and to Christianity and to the Christian faithful. On the contrary, the resistance is fighting to defend them against unrelenting Zionist pressure in the case of Jerusalem, the Armenian community recently thuggishly extorted their property stolen from them uh, their people beaten and uh, arrested. And of course, it wasn't the Islamic extremists that destroyed the Holy Family Church in Gaza and murdered its parishioners. It was the state of Israel that did that. Syed is in Pennsylvania on Palestine. Let's hear from him. Syed, welcome. How are you? By the grace of God, I'm good. What would you like to say? Oh my gosh, it's a pleasure meeting you. I mean, talking to you, man, I, I, I can't even believe this. Ever since the Sky News you, interview from way back when, God bless you and your family, I, I hope. 2006, do, yeah, God nearly 20 you. years now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I go have ahead. family. Go ahead, I'm, the, I'm a first generation uh, Palestinian American. My, I still have family in West Bank. I saw a family, my wife's family is in Gaza. Uh, just talking about, just talking about breaks me up. But even if I just sit here and I cry at moments, man, I just, I'm just hoping they are trying to escape to Egypt. Um, I just, I walked into the bodega and Yemen's were, uh, Yemen's were uh, running the bodega in New York, and I just started crying to him. I started I started praising him and crying to him, thanking thanking him, and they were it, it just. I'm sorry. No, I'm it's sorry, okay. Jordan, I, I understand. Uh, no, no, brother. I, I understand how emotional uh, all of this is. Uh, you mustn't make me cry uh, because. Much of this makes me want to weep. Uh, my heart is broken, but my spirit is not, said the British uh, Palestinian ambassador, Hussam Zomlot, uh, in the uh, rally in London yesterday. And I think that's 
how we must approach it. If we have a heart, it must be broken by what we have been witnessing. But if we allow our spirit to be broken, then the evil will have won. And so our spirit must remain whole and determined to do anything that we can to try and make sure that something is saved from this burning house that Erobus just talked about from New York. Now look, a quick break. Coming up, I've got an amazing guest, a young boy called Jamal Mohammed, a Palestinian-American activist who was made famous by an altercation on an ice rink. Not since Rocky wooed Adrian on the ice in Rocky 1. Have I seen anything like it? Stay tuned. I'll be right back. As the green smoke rose, their faces flashed out pallid green and faded again as it vanished. Then slowly the hissing passed into a humming, into a long, loud, droning noise. Suddenly a humped shape rose out of the pit and the ghost of a beam of light seemed to flicker out after it. Forthwith, flashes of actual flame, a bright glare leaping from one to another, sprang from the scattered group of men. It was as if some invisible jet impinged upon them and flashed into white flame. It was as if each man were suddenly and momentarily turned to fire. Well, 36,561 people have voted. You've got about another 20 minutes left to vote. It's not going to quite reach the record number, which I think, if I remember rightly, was 40,000, but it is an enormous poll nonetheless. Are the US-UK attacks on Yemen justifiable self-defense? Well, so far, 98, 89, 90, and 94% of that vast poll response of more than 36,000 people have said, no, it isn't. Now look, what am I talking about? Rocky and Adrian and Jamal, Mohammed, the American ice skater. Well, take a quick look at this. There is no re-entry after ice. Apartheid? Thank you for skating. Apartheid, huh? Of America, Winter Village. At so Bryant. you came over and you want a fist bump, and then you start telling me that this was an apartheid. Why are you harassing me? I just had to pause and started recording. Why? But why are you harassing me on the ice? Because you are very pro genocide, apartheid, and fascist state. Oh. So when I see you in person, I want to tell you my opinion. So we're on the well, ice. You you're, we're on the ice. We're expect. on the ice in a public space. You can't expect this is a public space. Public. So you expect me. Well, let's find out who he was talking to and why Jamal Mohammed joins us now from the United States. I must say, it looked uh, the best ice rink in the world there, uh, Jamal. Uh, did all this come out of the blue? Who were you talking to? Why? And what was it all about? Well, I just want to say uh, thank you for having me on. Um, and yeah, so I was in New York visiting family. And I was ice skating and I recognized Rabbi Shmuley from Piers Morgan. And there's two videos. That was one of them. But the other video, I kind of I recognized him. Yep, that's the face. And uh, I go up to him and I just kind of give him a fist bump and I say, free Palestine. He ends up, you know, kind of calmly saying, no, why would you say that? Why would you say that to me? And then pulls out his phone and he goes, why would you say that knowing it's an anti-Semitic slur for the death of Israel? And then starts being super aggressive and like just saying the most outlandish things. Um, I end up just keep on saying free Palestine, free Palestine. And uh, he was really aggressive, trying to get me angry, trying to instigate something. But my mom raised me better than that, you know, to get angry and stuff like that. 
and the video you showed he kind of well, goes off to the side yeah and he puts on these glasses and yeah. that's the video that he recorded me through glasses on that one he, he's not just nobody uh this is uh one of the most prominent supporters of israeli fanaticism uh in the united states and there's hot competition uh for that uh accolade uh and he's also of course the bosom buddy uh, of Netanyahu's candidate uh, for president, Robert F. Kennedy. God, I can hardly bring myself to say these words. What happened next? Did he did he attempt to uh, demonize you across the United States, across the media? Yeah, that's that's exactly what he did. He painted me as like a pro Hamas thug, uh, a pro gang rape. He's saying he was attacked. Um, and I was super calm. I did absolutely nothing. And then he tried. He tried to weaponize anti-Semitism, and that's something people like him do. You know, he he's known for being someone to spread that sort of hate speech, genocidal speech. But you know, his use to weaponize anti-Semitism, create these perspectives, is what fuels you know the the ideology of Zionism. Now, what's your background, uh, Jamal? You're clearly a Palestinian uh, American. Where are your family from? And uh, uh, what are you doing in the struggle now? Yeah, so I'm a second generation Palestinian American. I was born in North Carolina. Uh, my mom was born in New Jersey. My dad is born in Venezuela. But both of my grandparents are from Palestine. We're from the West Bank. And right now I work with the Arab Student Association at North Carolina State University. And we've been doing a lot of things like protests, vigils. We've been holding bake sales for fundraising in Gaza to, um, to support any way possible. Well, I've seen all your videos and we've now seen you here on the mother of all talk shows. You're a credit to your parents and to your grandparents, a credit to your university May God preserve you and may you achieve your goals. Thanks very much for joining us on You're the mother me. of Thank all you. talk shows. 36,627 of you have voted. Are the US-UK attacks on Yemen justifiable self-defense? You've got 10 minutes left to get your vote in on that. Ah, now, uh, I've got the one and only Gayatri my good wife, with a social media roundup at quarter to nine. Uh, but let me read some of the social media. Email from Tony. George, Russian hypersonic missiles have destroyed Ukrainian air defenses. Even Kiev has wide open skies. NATO technology isn't working so well. Thanks, Tony. DFB7 says they supported the French resistance back in the day. So why not the Palestinian resistance? People struggle to answer that. Indeed, they do. Krivish1 says, RIP, Gonzalo Lira, we are all indebted to you for your humanity, bravery, and the ultimate sacrifice that you made on the altar of the free world. Indeed, God rest, Gonzalo Lira. Vivian Needle says, and Sunak just gave them 3.2 billion of UK Taxpayers' money, R.I.P. Gonzalo. Pale Rider says, R.I.P. Gonzalo Lira, uh, Lira, shame on the U.S. government who did nothing for his release. Let's take a call from Manchester, Ardo, on Palestine. Go ahead. And I just, uh, you kind of covered my point when you were just speaking to the legend, Professor Mirandi. You've just touched upon it. Um, but I wanted to pay homage yep. to South Africa's legal team and present in a manner they did how eloquently they put, put the case against the baby killers um, in the ICJ um, and speak about why I'm supporting Yemen. Um, we value the arms going into um, Israel, and I say we, I say the British government and the cargo on the ships, a lot more than we do human mm. life, and that's why we've justified a military sure. response. So I want to just present three yeah. examples of our hypocrisy and double standards. Exhibit A, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. the Turkish flotilla carrying humanitarian aid was attacked in 2010, and David Cameron did nothing, all just empty words and condemned it. 
Exhibit B in 2019, um, we seized a Syrian, uh, an Iranian oil tanker heading to Syria in international waters off the coast of Gibraltar. In, in, that was in, in 2019. Gibraltar, yeah. yeah, and we did absolutely nothing yep. about it. We didn't bomb ourselves, did we, for that? That was absolutely fine for us to do. And that was given in, in cold times in Syria when it was freezing cold. We had laid siege on this poor Syrian people because we didn't like the government. And Exhibit C, what I want to raise to your attention, which, I've, again, uh, Professor Mirandi may have mentioned, America didn't bomb itself, did it, for the piracy when it, stu when it um, stole oil. One, one million barrels, I think, and took it to the Texas coast in 2021. So, Your Honour, Mr Galloway, I want to say the UK and America are guilty of hypocrisy and double standards, and I can't understand why other people can't see that and condemn the Iranian-backed Houthi rebels. No one re refers to Israel as the American-backed Likud um, baby yeah. killers. No, exactly. Exactly. A and wonderful, I wonderful call, Ardo. Uh, you are a credit to uh, Manchester, just as the blood of some people is more valuable than the blood of others. Some cargoes are clearly much more valuable than others. Frank is in New Jersey. Uh, Frank, welcome to the show. What would you like to say? Hi, George. I just want to say it's an honor to speak to you, and I would want to ask you if you, you consider running for prime minister or president and, you know, save this world. Well, uh, I, I, I would have liked to have run for President of the United States, given the field that there is. Uh, but of course, I wasn't born there. Uh, although uh, my great-great-grandmother was born in New York, she emigrated from New York to Dundee in Scotland, probably got on the wrong boat. That's the only way I can explain it. Uh, but uh, you do have not one, but two good candidates worth supporting for President of the United States, Frank. One is the one I would support, my old friend, Dr. Jill Stein, who is running for the Green Party. But Dr. Cornel West, also uh, uh, volcanically eloquent supporter of all that is good in the United States. So get behind them. Frank, last word to you. Um, I just want to say that you are an amazing, amazing person, and you are a true hero of the world. And I just want to wish you the best you. in everything you do. God bless you. Thank you, Frank, uh, for that. Uh, comments coming in for the devilishly handsome Jamal uh, on the ice. Uh, Jorge Vidal says, we want Jamal back, great and smart human. Why don't we actually put Jamal on every week for a, a quick uh, vignette uh, from, uh, from New York or from uh, North Carolina? Uh, Kishan Singh says, Jamal is a hero and a fantastic rep for the young adults, all of whom now know the truth of Western democracy. And uh, Erobos Abzu Lamashu says, what a wonderful, beautiful, powerful young man. Palestine will be free. He doesn't mean me. He means Jamal. Comments on the Craig Murray interview. Sheila Campbell says, what a hero, Craig Murray. And Era says, makes no difference. Benjamin Netanyahu has already said the Hague won't stop him. No, but if the court were to find in South Africa's favour, it would be very difficult for many European countries, including Era, to continue to give cover to Netanyahu's official genocide. Bob is in Iowa on Yemen. Told you it's an international global university of the airwaves. Bob, welcome. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm here in, in frozen Iowa, and uh, it's really an honor to talk to you. Um, yeah, I'm thank definitely you, opposed to, uh, to the bombing of Yemen, and, and I'm here in the United States where we supply most of the weapons, uh, and I find that uh, it's probably going to keep on because there's so much money being made by so many people. Um, our congressmen, our senators, they're all backed by the arms makers, the death dealers. 
And uh, yeah, I, I I don't know what to say. You know, I I can look across well, the river the and there's the of war. Yeah, go on. What's across the river? Across the river is the Rock Island Arsenal, which uh, used to make a lot of uh, weapons. Right now, I think they just control where the weapons are going. Um, and my other statement was yep. um, when you had Colonel McGregor on a while ago. Yeah. He, I thought he was making some kind of absurd statements about about how white people controlling the war, the world, and 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 uh, he talked about closing the borders here in the U.S. and about crime, and and I found that a little disturbing. I don't know if you did or not. No, uh, I mean, the United States is entitled to borders, and it's entitled to decide who comes across them, isn't it? Uh, well, a lot of those people that want to come across actually were driven here by what we have done in South and Central America and across the world. Sure, I know that. Uh, sure, I know that. But the workers in Iowa have a difficult enough uh, situation uh, without adding to the situation in Iowa, uh, the uh, collapse of the borders of the United States. There are many people who feel like that. Uh, some of them are out-and-out -out reactionaries, uh, but some of them are not. Uh, some of them are labor leaders who have to uh, try and maintain levels of wages and conditions uh, for the workers that are already in the United States. Others are concerned about the uh, actual security uh, of the people of the United States. Your country is insecure enough already without adding to the threats to its uh, security. So uh, I was not alarmed by Colonel McGregor. As a matter of fact, I think Colonel McGregor is one of the most inspiring guests we've had here on the moats. Bob, last word to you. Well, I, you know, I, I have seen him often on, on YouTube, and I always kind of respected him. But he was making some comments mm -hmm. about about uh, how many white people fought in the Second World War, and he was talking about the uh, diversity. Well, that's true. I mean, uh, that, that, yeah, but that's true, Bob. Why shouldn't uh, you talk about the white people uh, who gave their lives in the Second World War? Are they yeah, children he, of he, a lesser God because they're white? No, but he he was talking about the equity and diversity was corrupting our military. I, I just, uh, well, well, I'm a conscientious well, objector. Uh, I really I mean, don't think we... Yeah, well, that's, that. look, whether or not your army is led by men in lipstick and skirts is entirely your affair. It has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with the world audience that are watching this. These are purely American domestic decisions to make. Just don't impose it on the rest of the world, is all that I say. Thanks, Bob. Talat is in Nottingham on the BDS legislation. Go ahead, Talat. Hi, hi George. Thanks for having me on. I do appreciate this. I, I love watching your show. You're always into it, and you always uh, are the voice for the voiceless. Uh, yeah, so uh, obviously uh, you, the government's introducing this BDS into uh, motion now, and I just wanted to have your view uh, how we could uh, sort of you know tackle it moving forward, because if it if it does actually pass through law, uh, I mean, is what would happen, and how can we overcome that? I mean, in your opinion, do you think that will happen? Do you think it will be passed through law? Uh, yeah, it's already through the House of Commons with a significant uh, majority. I have little doubt uh, that it will complete its passage and get the signature of that paragon of virtue, King Charles III. Uh, so it will be law. And it's yet another example of the freedoms that we had, that we fought for in the Second World War, uh, that have been shredded. It takes power away from elected councils to decide where they invest their council's money, from whom they 
buy uh, goods and services for their local authority. It bans any public body, like a university or other uh, such public authority, from uh, boycotting anybody. Not It's Israel today we're talking about, but in the past it would have been South Africa. In the future, it may be anywhere else that we would like to boycott. And maybe the government of the day then will rue the day that they allowed this uh, legislation to pass. It is a crude, vulgar, and ultimately pointless exercise in defending the undefendable conduct of Netanyahu's Israel. But it will not force me to buy anything from Israel, and it will not force you to buy anything from Israel. It will not stop me encouraging you not to go on holiday to Israel. It will not stop me encouraging you not to buy Israeli dates or oranges or any other product coming from there. I'll do that as a free man. And until my last breath, I will do it as a free man. If my country is less free, my mind and my heart will never be imprisoned. And I'll continue to fight for the same kind of international isolation of apartheid Israel that I fought for in the 70s and the 80s to isolate apartheid South Africa. And so should you, Talat. Thanks for the call. DFB7 says Israeli courts may stop Netanyahu yet with the corruption charges. Indeed. But that won't necessarily stop the genocide because actually the gang that he's running with in the cabinet are, if anything, even more criminal than him. Angela Sharif says, thank you for all the work you do, George. If we weren't so brainwashed by our oppressive media, you would be prime minister here. But unfortunately, I don't think the curtain will ever lift high enough. Thanks, Angela. Most kind. Uh, I am running for mayor of London. Seven million people got the right to vote in that. And millions of them agree with me, at least on these subjects that we are discussing this evening. If they agree with me and vote for me, then I will be the most powerful directly elected person in Britain. Because, of course, the Prime Minister is not directly elected. But the Mayor of London is. I don't know if I'll succeed. Uh, but uh, I'm definitely going to try. And I'll definitely make an impact on the eventual outcome. Be sure about that. Uh, now, I get the chance now to talk to my wife. Which I now get twice a week, at least on screen. Gayatri, what's rattling? Right. Uh, in response to the poll, we have two patrons uh, saying uh, the following. Tony Martin says, if violence was justified to defend one's commercial interest, we'd be in a world of mobsters. Wait. <laughs> That's it. We are, in a, we are in a world of mobsters. We are. What's the difference? The difference is the quality of the suit. That's all. And not in all cases. Uh, but that's the quality okay. of the suit is all that's the difference between Joe Biden and, uh, and the Gambino uh, crime family. Uh, there's no other difference. Uh, they are crooks and mobsters. That's it. Matthew White says, capitalism is clearly more important, much more than innocent lives. People need their Amazon items ASAP so that those items can gather a layer of dust before finding themselves in a charity shop in a year's time. Like cancer, capitalism pursues never-ending growth. Like cancer, it consumes its host until the bitter end. Like cancer, it only stops upon death and destruction. The West disgusts me. Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, I understand uh, that's a power, very powerful, almost poetic uh, uh, message, but uh, nobody's Amazon was being delayed by the people of Yemen. 
the only traffic that was stopped by the people of Yemen was traffic going to or from Israel. What's wrong with that? That's an economic sanction. Aren't we all in favor of economic sanctions at the drop of a hat? That's all that the Yemenis said, that as long as you're massacring people in a genocide, we will not allow ships going to or from there. In doing so, they were the only Arab country to do anything. Lots talked, but they were the only ones who did something. And look, now what's happened? They're being invaded by the old colonial power and its successor in the United States using the airspace of other Arab countries to do it. Sorry, go on. No, exactly. I mean, uh, Yemen has been uh, living under bombardment for eight years ongoing, have, you know, can hardly look after themselves. But look, look what they're doing in defense of Palestine. I mean, the yeah. people can see them for what they, they are. are they're the purest. Here. They are the purest people of them all. They're the purest Arabs. They're the purest Muslims. And by the way, they're very, very good fighters. I've got to tell you that. Anything else? Last so, one? Yes, yes. So on the ICJ, ICJ um, John says, George, the evidence is irrefutable, plus the arrogance of Israel not even filing a response brief, which is normally done. Only a kangaroo court will find against the proud and brilliant South African presentation. True, isn't it? I mean, uh, yep. I was so moved by the South African presentation. I can't tell you how moved I was. I had a oh, lump in my here. throat throughout. Yep, cheering at the television. I hope our daughter, I, I hope our daughters grow up to be like the Irish King's Council who summed up for South Africa at the end. Now, Vijaya Surya Murthy says regarding Mrs. G, she looks prettier every week. By the grace of God, my good wife, Gayatri Galloway. I only left you this morning, uh, but uh, <laughs> already I... I, I, I miss you, and, and therefore I'm very glad you're on the show. Thank you very much for rounding up the social media commentary uh, for us. Uh, Kishan Singh says, what about Sikhs and other non-white Commonwealth soldiers who sacrificed their lives in the thousands in the two world wars? The colonel was a tad offensive. I agree with Bob. I don't actually, agree, uh, I don't actually remember what... Colonel McGregor said, I'll go back and uh, watch it. But I, I thank God for Colonel McGregor, who is, with all of his background and experience, standing with us on these great issues. Max Watson says, re Mayor of London, give it a go, George. It was a pleasure to shake your hand on the Strand yesterday. Thank you, Max. It was uh, nice to be back. Uh, Gayatri and I had... Uh, an enormously warm response from the public, uh, both in East London, in Newham the night before, uh, when I addressed a packed meeting uh, on Gaza, and all day yesterday uh, on the streets of London. Thank you for that. Back to the lines. Mohammed in Maryland, on Yemen. Go ahead, Mohammed. Hi, George. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, God bless you and your family. Thank You're you. a hero, and you have changed the Thank paradigm you, in which we engage the topics of the Middle East altogether. I think, and especially the topic Thank of you. Palestine, you helped to make that change, mm. and you deserve a ton of credit for it. Um, Thank as you, As far as I, I, I heard Craig Murray speaking about the case in the ICJ, yeah. and he's said something to the effect of he should feel truly defeated if the ICJ were to judge wrongly in this case. And yeah. to that, I would say that it certainly seems like that's a possibility. However, the victory created by people like yourself and Craig may not be in the form of a win in that court, but certainly you are victorious in the sense that you've altered this upcoming generation. So I would say keep it up and don't give up. 
to him. Wow. Wow. What a brilliant, brilliant call. Thank you, Mohammed, in Maryland. You're making me cry. Uh, Deb is in Ontario on politicians. We better hear her. Deb, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, it's just an honor to talk to you. I uh, wanted to listen to you in 2009 you. when the Canadian government decided that you couldn't come, and I was shamed by our government then and continue to be, but... Uh, that aside, Thank you, I would but like the, to... But the court, the court overturned it, don't forget. The court gave That's Jason right. Kenney a judicial caning and found uh, in, a, I think, a 30-page uh, judgment uh, that it was wholly unlawful what he had done. Anyway, sorry, Deb, go ahead. That's okay. Are you planning on coming back here? Uh, I'm not sure that Justin Trudeau uh, would allow it, <laughs> but invite me and I'll see. I'll invite you, okay, but that would got to be before Polyev gets in because that's going to be worse. But I digress. Is um, it? I just wanted okay. to say... Could it be worse? My question Could it be worse? Oh, God, yes. Oh, my heavens, okay. yes. If Go you on. just read up on him... Right from the get-go, he said all the rallies were pro-Hamas supporters, and he, he was vile with his language. He is not a nice man. But anyway, um, my question is, as an MP, or should I say ex-MP? I'm not quite sure on your status how that works. Ex, yes. How do, ex, ex, yes. How do, ex, okay. So how do, or how did your peers... Um, justify closing their eyes to something that's been going on for 75 years. And I mean, it's all the Western countries, and, and not just all the Western countries, like all the countries in the world, everybody knows what's happened with occupation, apartheid, for so many years. So many political parties get turned over, and the next one comes, and they all know. How do they live with themselves? Like, like from your perspective, how did your peers... Mm deal with that like do they know secretly and they have their own opinions but for economic or political Most gains them, yeah. do they just keep their yeah. mouth shut again yeah i mean it's for career advancement it's for uh financial and other gain uh but definitely most of them know i mean i i gave so many speeches in parliament they're all there in the public uh sphere you can look them up uh in which I schooled them on the origin of the Palestinian tragedy, which was authored in the very room in which I was then speaking, the one with the green benches in it. Uh, we were the authors of the Palestinian tragedy, and I gave them chapter and verse, though most simply don't want to hear it, and even if they hear it, uh, they care not. We have to face uh, an uncomfortable fact, Deb. We, I don't mean you and me, or your mother and father, or mine, uh, definitely not. But we as a country, and you as a country, are the product of centuries of colonial exploitation, occupation, depredation, we, as George Orwell puts it in Burmese days, we practice imperialism. What is imperialism, asks the girl that he's talking to. And he says it's going to other people's countries and stealing their things. That's what we did all over the world. That's why you are in Canada. That's what Canada did. That's what the colonialists did when they arrived in a land which already belonged to somebody else. And they stole its things and killed its original people. And so if you are from that history, then of course you most unwakened people look at the world in a different way. American exceptionalism is a thing. British exceptionalism is a thing. White exceptionalism is a thing. European exceptionalism is a thing. How could it be otherwise? We ruled the world for 500 years together. These societies that I have just adumbrated, 
And in order to justify ruling the world, you have to believe that you are exceptional. You are superior. They are inferior. They are children of a lesser God. You have to. Otherwise, how could you justify sailing thousands of miles, pitching up on the beach, planting your flag and saying, this all now belongs to us? Of course, that leaves its mark. A stain on the thinking of so many people. And when you add in self-interest, I mean, the vast majority of the British Parliament are officially caps friends of Israel. Why? Not because they are in love with the with the with the Shankin Street in Tel Aviv. Uh, not because they are big fans of organized religion in West Jerusalem, in Mir Sharim. No, they don't care about these things. They are friends of Israel because that's the way to get on in politics. It's the way to get promoted. And the converse is also true. If you're a friend of Palestine, you probably ain't going anywhere in British politics, in Western politics. I've told the story before. The last time I ran for mayor of London, 10 years or so ago, I got off our campaign bus and a wonderful old man, a Jewish ex-serviceman with a beret and medals, was waiting for a bus to go to some uh, ceremony somewhere. And he hugged me and I hugged him. And he said to me the words, if you had been with us, you would have been in 10 Downing Street today, not running for mayor of London. Maybe he was right. But here I stand, I can do no other. This is what I believe in. And I could never pretend to believe something else. Scott L. says, Colonel McGregor is absolutely not anti-LGBT. He is stating the obvious that all need to be up to the task, physically and mentally, in the military. Lowering standards to get into the military is bad. Poll results are in. 37,899 people have voted. And overwhelmingly, I think the average about 95% reject the US-UK attacks supposedly being in self-defense. Thank you uh, for uh, all of those votes and thank you for the decisive Result. Uh, Kishan says, George, do not underestimate what you're doing. You are articulating what millions on this planet are feeling. You are enabling a platform for others to do the same. Become the mayor. Thank you so much, Kishan. Last call is the legend Norma in Bristol. Norma, what would you like to Hello. say? Hi, good show, Hi. George. Good show. No, I just. You did mention you. at the beginning about the um, arrest of Dr. Ranjit Bra by the Metropolitan Police. Yeah. The, his child, yeah. in, only four years old, on the pavement. And um, yeah. I found it very upsetting, really. Um, and I just wanted to say how sorry I am. Well, it's not my fault, but it, it, it wasn't good seeing that, really. No, I uh, it's, it very, it's, it's, it's very distressing. Uh, we're no longer friends, we're no longer colleagues, uh, but it's very, very distressing uh, that uh, all this can be done, there it is there on the screen, all this can be done to an NHS surgeon for something allegedly written in a leaflet that's being handed out, whilst children are being massacred with our active compliance in Gaza. It's truly unbelievable. Now, I don't know what was in the leaflet. I haven't read it yet. I dare say I would disagree with at least the way in which whatever was on the leaflet was expressed. Maybe, maybe not. I haven't seen it. But have we really reached the stage 
with a distinguished surgeon? Has his shoulder dislocated? Has his four-year-old child left on the pavement? Has handcuffs put on him over something written on a piece of paper? Really? I've said this before. There's a crime wave in London. Probably at exactly the same time, four people were shot and stabbed in Brixton, in South London. There's a knife epidemic. There's a gun epidemic. There's a drug epidemic. I was in a street yesterday where there's a prostitution epidemic. And yet all these police resources were deployed to huckle an NHS surgeon for something written in a leaflet that he may not even have written. Something far wrong with the priorities of the Metropolitan Police. That's all we've got time for, Norma. And I bless you for bringing that up. I need to close the show with some remembrances of our late friend Gonzalo Lira. You know, some people wrote mean things about Gonzalo. They distrusted him. They cast aspersions on what his actual true role should be and so on. And, you know, there are conspiracies in the world. So it's right for everyone to be on their guard. But sometimes if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's because it is a duck. And it's now clear that Gonzalo Lira was what he presented himself as. A man with a checkered past, a man with checkered views, but a man who was brave enough to stand up to the crooks in Kiev that have brought disaster down upon the whole people of the Ukraine. The Russian-speaking people there and the Ukrainian people there, Ukrainian-speaking people there. These crooks in Kiev have caused the loss of hundreds of thousands of dead people, of the destruction of swathes of infrastructure in their country. They have poisoned relations in their region for decades to come. And Gonzalo stood up against it. He spoke clearly, too clearly maybe, against it. He was threatened, but did not bow to those threats. He tried to flee, but was captured. The murderers were the Ukrainian state, but the murder was only made possible by the deliberate inaction which now becomes, now that he is dead, the deliberate collaboration of the Biden regime in Washington with the Zelensky regime in Kiev. Not content with handing over hundreds of billions of dollars of the American people's money, they have conspired with a foreign government to murder their own citizen, Gonzalo Lira, a fond memory. His words will live on. His face will be remembered long after the people who murdered him in the dungeons of a dying regime are long forgotten. I have no time left. Indeed, I'm four minutes and 47 minutes over. So forgive me uh, if I now say good night. I'll be back on Wednesday at the later time of 9 p.m. with the midweek mother of all talk shows. And then Thursday with no to NATO, no to war. And then Saturday on the streets of Birmingham. See you.